University and the Harmsworth Professorship at Oxford University. There's very few uh, people who've held them both. Published over 60 scholarly articles and 11 books, many of which have won awards. Imagining the Past, East Hampton Histories won the Historic Preservation Prize. And one of his more recent books, The Marketplace of Revolution, How Consumer Politics Shaped American Independence, won the Colonial War Society Prize. Uh, he co-edited a, a book called Mine Own Ground. I think it came out in the late 70s, um, maybe 1980, uh, with, um, uh, with uh, Steve Innes, who was uh, actually my advisor as an undergraduate at the University of Virginia. Uh, and it really is a book that I taught it in my classroom. Everybody has taught it. I, it was taught to me in my classroom. And this is a, a, a book that really helps people understand race and slavery in, uh, in 17th century Virginia. It's really a classic study uh, and, a, and a fantastic uh, book. Uh, just to give you some of the, the sense of the range of, uh, of, of Breen's work. Tonight, he's going to talk about his new book, uh, George Washington's Journey, The President Forges a New Nation. Uh, we were honored to have him here in 2013 as the Gay Gaines uh, uh, lecturer. He spoke a little bit about this, this work, and uh, tonight we're going to hear what he made of it. So everybody, please give a big Mount Vernon welcome to Tim Breen. Thank you, uh, Doug, for that nice uh, introduction. It makes me a little uncomfortable when I hear an introduction of that. Like, it sounds like an obituary, you know? I'm standing there, <laughs> well, who's, who's, who died that he's talking about there? But um, uh, Doug, Doug has been a, a very supportive person for me, as has Mount Vernon. Uh, the lectures that eventuated into the book that we're going to discuss tonight, um, uh, in a sense, started here. Um, the uh, uh, Gayhart Gaines lectures, um, I think it was two, two years ago, and uh, the pressure of, uh, it's easy for scholars, as Doug knows very well, to accept invitations. That's great, especially if there's a stipend. But, um, <laughs> uh, but then, you know, it's sometime it comes due and you realize your desk is still cluttered with notes and uh, half-baked ideas. And so having the opportunity to lecture here forced me to organize uh, the material um, that uh, actually in, in time uh, became uh, the book. And I'll be glad at the end of this lecture to answer any questions, including hint, hint, the one about the slide here, but I'm not going to talk about it. You have to ask me. <laughs> but Doug has given me an opportunity tonight that I almost took. And that is, uh, that's the opportunity for an author, me, to review my own book. You know, it's a pressing need. You know, as, a, as an author, I get very grumpy about reviewers. You know, they always miss the good points. They, 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 they downgrade my creativity. And one of my colleagues suggested, and maybe some of you uh, can take it up, uh, the need for a, a new journal, especially for historians, where authors can review their own books, you see. <laughs> and it, 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 you know, it probably wouldn't have a large circulation, but it would make, make people like me feel better, because it'd be a lot of, lot of praise. But modesty, which of course you already see is my long suit, um, pro, pro, prohibits uh, self-praise tonight. Just let me say to you, just entre nous, this is a terrific book. <laughs> and you ought to have one in every room. You know, there, there, there are multiple copies. About the quality of the argument, about what's in those pages, you can judge for yourself. But let me say that of all 12 books I've written, um, uh, this was, in a sense, the most, most fun, the most enjoyable. It uh, got me out onto the road with George Washington. I traveled with George Washington for almost 3,000 miles and uh, it was a totally different kind of experience as a scholar to have this kind of uh, enterprise. So tonight on this snowy night, uh, by the way I live in northern Vermont so don't complain to me about cold or anything. <laughs> then uh, I want to depict uh, for you, a uh, George Washington, most of you probably don't know, even the Mount Vernon fan club. 
I'm going to depict a man of extraordinary political vision, a man who was a gifted innovator, a person who understood as powerfully as any of the subsequent presidents of the United States that our government is ultimately based on the will of the people. And during his first years as President of the United States, even during the very first months of office, this diffident, often socially awkward man opened the door to a level of political participation in the political culture of the time that no one could have predicted beforehand. He invited many people who did not then hold the vote, women as well as men, poorer Americans, northerners, southerners, to give voice to their thoughts about the future of our country through a vehicle that we now know and take for granted called public opinion, but it was new to Washington's time. And so at the very start of our nation's history, Washington devised a plan, a bold, innovative plan to bring the federal government to the people. And that trip still shapes our expectations of the political process today. Washington decided quite on his own to take a journey to a new nation. Now, my claims, my arguments may strike you as large, but let me say by way of introduction that over the last uh, several years, by the prodding of Mount Vernon in part, I feel that I personally have gotten to know George Washington. Now, don't be alarmed. No, I, I, I know the, the conversations were muted. But while I was doing research for the book, I literally traveled the same roads, stayed in the same towns. I drove and I tried to drive uh, the paths that he took, several thousands of miles from Savannah, Georgia, and Augusta, all the way up to the current state of Maine, a Kittering. But in all those trips that I took with George Washington, one moment stands out for me, a memory when I discovered I had a sense of why contemporaries both admired and respected George Washington so much. If you follow his diaries, his printed diaries, they're, they're, they're a marvelous source. I, I, you can read them just, just for pleasure. But if you read those diaries as I did, you will learn that on May 1st, 1791, Washington left Georgetown, South Carolina for Charleston. The roads of that region were poor, they still are. The scenery was often boring. He reported in his diary, and I quote, all I saw were sand and pine barrens with very few inhabitants. So in part to break the monotony of the trip, Washington decided to pay a visit to Hampton, which was the manor house of a huge rice plantation long associated with two of the most prominent families in South Carolina, the Pinckneys and the Orries. Originally built in the year 1730, Hampton is located a few miles off the main road. When Washington arrived at Hampton, he was greeted by several extraordinary and powerful women, Elijah Pinckney, who is credited with making indigo a commercial crop, and also her daughter, Harriet Ory, who was recently widowed when her husband was killed during the American Revolution. So after breakfast, Washington and Mrs. Horry took a around, walk around the grounds. It probably was a little awkward making conversation. And perhaps to spark the moment, she informed the president that she, she intended to cut down, I have it here. Are we gonna go? Oh, hello. Hello, IT people. Where are you? <laughs> oh, that one. No, no. She'll just go on. I call these audiovisual obstructions. <laughs> Let me grab in here. Yeah. 
There you go. And what, and what did you enter the next one? All right. So there you see a large tree, and uh, the president and Ms. Zori were walking, and she said, you know, I think I'm going to cut that tree down. Because when you come up to the house, you see it blocks the view of the house. That's not the way a mansion's supposed to be. You're supposed to appreciate the whole front of the house, and the, the tree gets in the way. Washington looked at the tree and said to Mrs. Horry, Mrs. Horry, let it stay. The tree can do no harm where it is, and I would not think of cutting it down. And his intervention has uh, saved the tree. It still lives. It was 200 years old then. It's now 500 years old, and it is known as the Washington Oak. And I will tell you, as a historian, meeting a tree that George Washington met was a great experience on the road. <laughs> The story of the tree may remind us that through his long career, Washington repeatedly demonstrated a, an enviable ability to listen, to observe, to take counsel, to change his mind, to grow as he accepted ever more demanding public responsibilities. Perhaps we bundle all that and we call it leadership. By my count, he saved our country three times. You may have more, but two are obvious to all of you. They go back to your grade school courses. He kept the Continental Army together for many years, an uh, army that suffered many setbacks and was seldom supported by our Congress. But if Washington, had, during those years, had become despondent, if he had lost faith in the country, we would not have defeated uh, Great Britain. And second, at Newburgh, New York, after the war was over, when many of the officers were feeling abused because they had not received their salary, and contemplated a coup, an organized takeover of the national government, Washington reminded them that in a republic, as he told Alexander Hamilton, an army is a dangerous thing to play with in a republic. And those are wise words. But the third time Washington responded to the needs of the country may not be familiar to you mostly because you haven't read my book yet, but that's all. <laughs> and that is not surprising. It's an event that has been little uh, studied. Indeed, it has been treated as a curiosity, and that is a mistake. Without prodding from his more bookish colleagues, Adams, Madison, Hamilton, Jay, Jefferson, the President of the United States came to appreciate more than perhaps any of them did that a person who owed his office to the people, whose very claim to authority derived from people, had to make himself accessible to those people. It was the challenge that lay at the heart of the new Republican system of government. And it was this insight, this sense of responsibility, that compelled George Washington literally to take to the road. And between the year 1789 and 1791, Washington organized several journeys, which carried him to all of the original 13 states. And I might say that travel then by coach was extremely difficult, covering thousands of miles over very dubious roads. And on two occasions, the president almost lost his life in accidents on the road. And while I'm not going to engage in counterfactual history, everyone in this audience can imagine if in the first few months of the president's first term he had been killed, what the subsequent history of the early republic might have been, but he wasn't killed. Now the first trip took him from Mount Vernon to New York City for his inauguration as president, and it covered those middle states, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and later that year, in 1789, he visited New England, a region of the country which, despite its proclaimed revolutionary heritage, was very dubious about belonging to the future of this federal government. Washington then, in 1790, took a brief trip to Rhode Island, an action uh, that was to make up for Rhode Island's hesitancy to ratify the Constitution but when it came on board, he agreed to visit Rhode Island. 
and the most arduous part of the great journey began in the spring of 1791 and it lasted several months as Washington traveled the south from the then capital of Philadelphia all the way to Georgia and then back up into the back country to Charlotte, Salisbury, Salem, Winston-Salem and other places that you can see on your imaginary map. It left, it, it took several months and indeed the members of his cabinet, prominently Jefferson and Hamilton, had no idea what would happen to the government should something happen. I mean, how do you contact a president who is in Augusta, Georgia, when there's a French battle cruiser in front of New York, but that didn't happen. Washington explained uh, why he took this trip. In 1791, he penned a letter it was among my first determination when I entered uh, upon the duties of my present office to visit every part of the United States in the course of my administration. Now this is a terse statement, very typical of Washington's laconic style, and hardly communicated the broader purpose of his remarkable enterprise. Indeed, the historian, all of us have to be careful not to take Washington's decision for granted. Because from a modern perspective, I, I, I think, we expect our presidents to interact with the people wherever they happen to live. Presidents are forever complaining about being trapped in the capital and renewing themselves with photo ops in California or Alaska or wherever they go. But Washington started it all. He was the first president who understood that power had to be communicated directly to the people, not filtered at a distance. Of course, gaining more accurate intelligence about the state of the nation represented only part of Washington's decision. He understood, as I think many historians have failed to understand, that the threads that bound the American people to a single shared political identity in 1789 were fragile and untested. Washington perhaps even more than his colleagues, since just how much the new government was an experiment. He was painfully aware, as anyone who reads his letters during this period, that he was operating in a world where every act was a precedent that might bound one of his successors. And in January 1790, in a very unusually reflective letter written to a woman historian in England, Catherine Macaulay, she's celebrated for her history of England at the time, Washington confessed, the establishment of our new government seemed to me the last great experiment for promoting human happiness by creating a reasonable compact in civil society. And he continued, not there, but in a minute, few who are not philosophical spectators can realize the difficulty and the delicate part which a man in my situation has to act. And he closed, in our progress towards political happiness, my situation is new. And if I may use the expression, I walk on untrodden ground. Wonderful expression. Every day was an experiment. There was no precedent for this man's decisions. The success, the survival of the federal government was by no means assured when Washington assumed the presidency. He understood, I guess, as I assume that we take for granted that something he knew, most revolutions in history have ended badly. Revolutions are not usually over when the last battle is fought. Revolution isn't over at Yorktown. Revolutions are over when a stable government is in place. This is something that the great revolutionary leaders of the world that Washington several seldom compared to know. Gandhi knew it in India. Mandela knew it in South Africa. Until there is stability in the country, the revolution is not over. And so this was very much a post-revolutionary trip to establish, to cement 
those emotional ties to the new federal government that we might recognize now as the stuff of nationalism or perhaps even patriotism. When Washington took office in 1789, most Americans' political horizons were very local, seldom extending beyond their own county, maybe their own states. And so by taking the federal government to the people, Washington not only enhanced the legitimacy of a strong central government for our republic, but also helped those ordinary Americans to comprehend that the United States in 1789 was more than the sum of its parts, more than the sum of its 13 parts. It had to be. And so it's this apprehensive figure, this worried Washington, walking on untrodden ground. This is not a Washington most scholars are familiar with. Indeed, few historians have seen Washington at this moment as a bold innovator or a daring risk taker. That's not the Washington most of us know. He's usually depicted, especially during the earliest years of his presidency, as a somewhat wooden figure who possessed admirable personal integrity but did not really inspire much intimacy or even deep affection. He was sort of like that uncle that appears at Christmas and you hope doesn't make a problem at dinner. He, re he receives credit for recruiting Alexander Hamilton, now a hip-hop star, uh, <laughs> and Thomas Jefferson into his cabinet. He receives credit for working with James Madison, who was then writing the Bill of Rights. And in such brilliant company, Washington recedes into the, the background, trying his best to keep a dysfunctional cabinet to work together. It was this genial Washington who convinced one Mason Locke Weems, otherwise known to you as Parson Weems, to reimagine Washington's entire life story. In Williams' famous Life of Washington, published in 1800, it's gone through hundreds of editions. Williams, by the way, was no clergyman. He, he took the word name Parson Williams because he knew it would sell books better. <laughs> you know, maybe that's something I should think about. <laughs> hmm, there you go. Anyway. <laughs> Williams invented all those wonderful tales about cutting down little cherry trees. There you go. Murdering that tree, throwing silver dollars over rivers, all kinds of things. They're all lies. Well, they're all fabrications. Modern historians generally uh, distance themselves from Williams's stories, but honesty makes these historians a little grumpy, as if they wish that the real Washington was a little more exciting than he may have been in fact. Now, I have to admit it's true. Uh, it would be an, uh, impossible to transform Washington into a polished conversationalist able to speak knowledgeably in dinner about French wines or English politics or philosophy. He was no Jefferson. Nevertheless, Washington's awkwardness in social situations should not serve as a reason to diminish his genuine talents or accomplishments. For unlike Jefferson and unlike Adams, Washington had little interest in theory. He instead, he brought to the office, to the country, a no-nonsense pragmatism about the office he held. He was fundamentally, he had always fundamentally been a man of action. And to understand his brilliance, one has to follow his feet rather than his table talk. Washington himself observed in 1797, with me it has always been a maximum rather to let my designs appear from my works than by my expressions. Works, action, decisions, rather than theoretically reflective uh, work. And so we encounter on the eve of Washington's accepting the presidency, a Washington wrestling with real political problems, confronting a situation which by his lights demanded action, the fulfillment of the revolution, the dangers of fragmentation. And so we might ask, what was the, the source of the decision to take 
the road to the country? The answer lies in part in Washington's conviction that the revolution, our revolution, had not yielded a government capable of responding to the needs of a growing, vibrant American people. Washington, when he retired from the Army and returned to Mount Vernon, regularly received reports from trusted friends that the, the country was falling, falling apart. I might say in all of the Washington correspondence, there are none that are more pessimistic, more spiritually depressing than the letters from John Jay in New York. And he could turn a sunny day into a miserable time. <laughs> And he constantly wrote to Washington, it's all over, George. The country's in trouble. Anarchy is brewing. Riots, oh, bad. What I fear most, Jay said, is that the better kind of people, by which I mean the people who are orderly and industrious, who are content with their situations, not uneasy in their circumstances, will be led by the insecurity of their property, the loss of confidence in their rulers, the one of public faith, to consider the charms of liberty as imaginary. It's a call for a more authoritarian government. The American people can't handle freedom. They can't handle liberty. Washington hated this kind of talk. It was anti-Republican talk. It was not simply because he rejected out of hand his entire career authoritarian thinking, but also because Unlike so many politicians with which we're familiar, he had a strong, positive vision for this country. A positive vision about where we could go if we would just simply accept the possibilities of a Republican system. And he knew, Washington knew in 1785, 86, 87, before the Constitution, he knew who was to blame, what, what was happening to the country, in his estimation, and this will shock some of you, so be prepared to shock. Right? For him, Washington thought the problem was the states. The states were the centers of the worst kind of parochial politics where dangerous demagogues built up factions and threatened the stability of the new country. I quote a letter from 1786. My opinion is, that there is more wickedness than ignorance in the conduct of the states, or in other words, in the conduct of those who have too much influence on the fabrication of our laws. Repeatedly, even when he was most disturbed about the direction of the Confederation government, Washington still put his faith in the people, not the demagogues, ordinary folks. And he insisted his message was that a strong, new, central government would bring the American people greater security. After all, there was France and England and Spain out there ready to attack, pick off a few states. A strong central government would bring you a kind of prosperity that no state could. The building of canals that would link Kentucky to Virginia would bring about a higher standard of living than any locality could ever promise. The Constitution, he thought, might be partly an answer. It did not, in fact, control the states. He and his friend Madison were disappointed. But Washington said about the Constitution, essentially, that half a loaf was acceptable. And so it was this kind of thinking that was in Washington's mind that he understood that he was the only person in 1789 capable of leading the nation, of helping it fulfill its own revolution. This sounds to our modern ears arrogant, self-serving. He was none of that. But like other great men over the centuries, again, I bring to your attention Gandhi and Mandela, he understood what we now call charisma. In a very real sense, in 1789, Washington was the nation. His very person, his body, his actions, his life symbolized this new republic. And he knew that he had the support of the American people. It was on 
his trip from Mount Vernon to New York City in 1789 that Washington first glimpsed how, how to turn inchoate, vague, even misinformed feelings about the nation, about our leadership, into a powerful commitment to a new federal union. That first journey, the one to New York City, the capital, started unpropitiously. Indeed, the president was in a really dark mood. As he left Virginia, as he left right where we are, he told his good friend, Colonel Humphreys, if my appointment and acceptance be inevitable, I fear I must bid adieu to all happiness, for I see nothing but clouds and darkness before me. And I call God to witness that the day which shall carry me again to public life will be the most distressing one that I have ever known. But providentially, those personal clouds and darkness soon cleared. On the road north to the Capitol, on the road north to New York, Washington, for the first time, met the people of America. That seems surprising, but before this trip, the people had always been something of a theoretical abstraction, something that philosophers wrote about. But now, coming up through Delaware, in Maryland, in Pennsylvania, Washington encountered huge crowds of men and women. They cheered widely, wildly. They proclaimed their support for him. They proclaimed their support for the new republic, the strong union that it represented. And it was on the road that he began to comprehend fully, for the first time, the power of public opinion in a republican society. The people counted. They mattered. You had to listen to them. And in spontaneous celebrations in town after town, Washington seemed to be taken solely by surprise. But whatever his expectations may have been, he learned an important and lasting lesson on the way to the inauguration. The political nation he encountered contained distinct though complementary groups. To be sure, in every town there were elite gentlemen, the leaders of society that gave receptions and teas and welcome. That's politics. But what he also saw was the ordinary people. They participated in these events. They came forward in large numbers. The crowds, the fireworks, the special songs that were written for the occasion, the stunning illuminations, a candle in every window, in every house in the town lit up. These were testimonies to the fact that the people were telling Washington, they were telling Washington how he fitted into their own stories about the meaning of the United States. That's what public opinion is about. It's a conversation concerning power in a republic. Witnessing from his carriage these repeated enthusiastic expressions of popular support, he may have reflected on the changing character of political life since the revolution. Gone were those colonial days of deference where the people nodded their cap when the gentry went by. And more, Washington discovered that his own ability to convey this message about the future, the positive future of our country, depended in large part on a newly empowered public. So instead of rejecting the people, as we might have thought this awkward man would do, instead of rejecting the people, instead of running away from change, he figured out how to incorporate the public opinion into his own mission to secure a strong central government. And by doing so, Washington began a conversation with a broader America that is still going on. Several incidents on that road to New York catch our attention. They reveal something about the process of transforming public political life. At a crossing, 
of the Schuylkill River, known as Gray's Ferries Bridge, a, a group had commissioned the great American artist Charles Wilson Peale to decorate this bridge in a matter suitable for the president going to the inauguration. And the results clearly impressed everyone who came to witness uh, the event. I'm going to skip over a number of slides. We're not, these, these are slides about, there you go. And I don't know if I, keep, keep your eye, can you see that little green thing that's in there? Right away? Yeah. Anyway, keep your eyes on that arch. So Peel really pulled out all the stops for the president. Indeed, one newspaper said, of Peel, it said, even the pencil of the great Raphael could not delineate something like this. Well, that's a little over the top, but <laughs> people, were, people were really enthusiastic about the whole thing. The artists did weave a jumble of symbols that served not only to welcome Washington, but also more important, to celebrate the creation of a new strong federal republic. On each of the four corners of the bridge that you see up there, Appeal placed a flag which consisted of a, a painted image or motto on a piece of cloth. In, in, in other words, there, there's communication, symbolic communication between an artist and the president, the people and the president. Uh, on, on one of the pennants uh, promoted economic prosperity and one flag depicted, and I quote, the rising sun more than half above the horizon. The sun's not going, it's not a sunset now, we're, we're going the other way. Another one praised the rising empire, another a new era. Everything about Peel's vision, Washington's vision, was positive about the future. If we would just simply keep the revolution going as Washington rode over this little bridge, I know it doesn't look like a bridge, but he had to go under that arch. Arches were seen as what great leaders and Roman emperors, they had to have arches apparently. So he rode through that arch and just when he got to the middle there, a young girl stepped out, happened to be Angelica Peel's daughter. She got a central role in the whole thing. And Washington stopped right in the middle of the arch to say, hello, young lady, how are you doing today? And just when he did so, and I read from a newspaper, as our beloved Washington passed the bridge, a lad, beautifully ornamented with springs of, sprigs of laurel, you can imagine it looked like a little tree, uh, assisted by certain mysterious machinery, let drop on our hero's head, unperceived by him, a crown of laurel. So you see, up there hidden somewhere on top of that arch, there's this plonk right on top of Washington's <laughs> head. Well, Washington seems to have pushed the crown aside, no doubt greatly embarrassed that anyone who had just been elected a president of a new republic would wear a crown of any sort. But there's more in the accounts and one newspaper in particular caught the, the temper, the character of, of this extraordinary moment. All classes and descriptions of citizens discovered the most undistinguished attachment, undisguised attachment, and unbounded zeal for our dear chief, and I may add, under God, the savior of our country. Not all the pomp of majesty not even imperial dignity itself, surrounded with its usual splendor and magnificence, could equal this interesting scene. This is the birth of a republican culture where we don't have aristocrats, no more kings, we don't have to bow and scrape because somebody's daddy happened to be a lord or a prince. And on he rode in his carriage through Philadelphia, great illuminations, great celebration, adoring people, on through New Jersey, on to Trenton. Trenton where he had carried out one of his most impressive military victories of his career. And here again, he came across kind of a triumphal arch. 
So you see that arch. This is all, these are from the times. This is not later renditions of history. He's riding along. I'll show you in a minute. He's, he's, he's riding along. There he is. You see? Marston just riding along on his little white horse. It's all theater. I mean, it was very, here comes the commander in chief on his horse to our little town. In Trenton, a local committee of women had constructed 13 columns for one for each state. They, they nicely uh, ignored the fact that Rhode Island and North Carolina had failed to come forward yet. <laughs> On the arch, in gilt lettering, you can't see it there. It, this is a modern, this is what kind of sappy, treacly 19th century rendering of our past. But anyway, on the, on the arch was the defender of the mothers will also defend the daughters. And even more poignant was a, a large artificial sunflower, which the newspaper explained, always pointing towards the sun. It was designed to express the sentiments or motto, to you alone, as emblematic of the affections and the hopes of the American people united in suffrage with millions of other citizens. And then an equally large and elaborate reception greeted Washington when he came to New York. People even said that porpoises in the Hudson River participated. And I don't have any, <laughs> any, any evidence of that, but that was what was said. As president of the United States, Washington reflected on the meaning of these experiences within Weeks of his inauguration, he sent a private memo to the members of his cabinet. Only Adams is, uh, has uh, survived, but it is this document that suggests to me that Washington was, if not an original thinker, certainly an original politician. It was written early in the controversy that greatly ignored, annoyed Washington. Adams had come up with a wacko scheme to give a fancy title to Washington, his majesty, defender of all republics, blah, blah, blah. And Washington thought it was, it echoed the European world that we had just exited. And he was happy with what the Constitution called the president, the president. And so Washington at this time was a little defensive because people said, it sounds like a kind of monarchical tone is settling down in the capital in Washington wanted to have none of it. In any case, in his memo, written on May 10th, 1789, Washington asked the members of his cabinet whether during the recess of Congress it would not be advantageous to the interest of the Union for the President to make a tour of the United States in order to become better acquainted with the principal characters and internal circumstances, as well as to become more accessible to numbers of well-informed persons who might give the president useful information and advices on political subjects. To no one's surprise, I suppose, Adams thought it was a stupid idea. <laughs> he answered the memo, a tour might no doubt be made by you with great advantage to the public, but I don't think time can be spared. And it seemed unlikely to Adams, he went on, after all, Mr. President, foreign affairs arrive every day and the business of the executive and the judicial departments require your constant attention. You can just see Adams kind of a little fussy, you know. Uh, in fact, Adams concluded in his rejoinder to the memo, the president's residence should be confined to one place. But curiously, even Adams sensed that the world was moving that things weren't the same. Because even as he urged Washington to stay in the capital, Adams noted, my long residence in Europe may have impressed me with a view of things incompatible with the present temper of the feelings of the American people. His political conscience was formed in another place. He, he didn't have the sensitivity of Washington. Other members of Washington's a uh, circle of advisors were open and sympathetic. Uh, Washington ex discussed the idea with Hamilton, who, and I quote Washington's diary, Hamilton thought it very desirable and advised me accordingly to take the tour. And, and so did Jay, and so did Madison. 
And so early on a wet and cold morning, October 15, 1789, Washington set out for a journey to the new country, to a new people. He set out literally to discover America. That's what my book is about, this journey. The first goal was to see New England, which people at the time called the Eastern States. Washington sat in a coach. His two personal secretaries, Major William Jackson and Tobias Lear, rode on horses beside the vehicle, as did several members of the cabinet as they left the Capitol. There was, Hamilton was there, Jay was there, Henry Knox, the Secretary of War. And they were followed by a second baggage cart that was driven by Paris, by Paris, very interesting man. It was a slave that Washington had brought up to New York from Mount Vernon, and he was in charge of all the costumes and materials that you need to stage political theater. At 11 o'clock, the rain had stopped, and the little cavalcade going to America reached Kingsbridge, which is now part of the Bronx. Hamilton and the others had already turned back to the city. According to Washington's diary, the party now included just Major Jackson, Mr. Lear, myself, and six servants. They dined at the house of Caleb Hoyle and then pushed on to Rye, New York, where they stayed, at, according to Washington, at a very neat and decent inn run by Mrs. Haviland. The next morning, the post road lay before them, post road to New Haven, to Hartford, Springfield, Boston, so too did a new nation that was just finding its way. And this was the stage on which Washington would perform a new kind of presidency. It was the road that he hoped would save the country from debilitating faction and localism. Many Americans later did not understand what Washington was saying. A few years later at the Hartford Convention, the Eastern States thought of secession, the Confederates thought of secession. A lot of local demagogues over the years have thought that they might make a go of it in a local way. That's their decision to talk about. But for us, we should remember that Washington's message was that we should pull together and protect the Union, and that is what he has to tell us. Thank you. Yes, Professor, uh, I was curious, during your research on, for this book, did it strike you at all that there seem to be incredible similarities between Washington and one other president, and that would be Dwight Eisenhower? Both led the nation through very, very difficult circumstances and prevailed in very important wars. Mm -hmm. Both of them seem, to me at least, to have a sense of not taking themselves too seriously stepping back, truly men of the people, and wanting to get out and meet the people, instead of telling the people what should be done or what they think, instead soliciting input from the populace. Mm -hmm. And I think the similarity that strikes me the most is that when I compare the trails, the, the uh, trips that Washington is taking to the 13 mm -hmm. states, it reminds me very much of what Eisenhower was asked to do, I believe as a major or as a colonel, after World War I, where he had to essentially map the roads of the United States mm -hmm. for purposes of determining whether we could easily right. mobilize. Mm -hmm. And I think in both instances, both of those individuals truly got a sense of the people mm -hmm. as a result of getting out there and meeting them. And I think it's suggested mm -hmm. just in his comments in your question eight, I believe, yeah. one of the other, right. other things. Well, that's a, that's a, a very helpful and insightful uh, comparison. I, it, it had not a, occurred to me. I ha actually had thought of Dwight Eisenhower in Washington in another capacity, but yours is uh, well taken. Um, as we all know, whenever we drive anywhere, 
uh, Eisenhower got us the interstate system. I, I hope we can keep it going, but he had a great vision for it. Um, and Washington looked at canals the same way Eisenhower looked at interstate highways because he thought that if, especially Kentucky and the, the states over on the other side of the Appalachian, um, were not bound by, by commerce and by travel, to that then pretty soon Kentucky would be act, acting like it was a colony of the Eastern State. We would relive the whole revolution again. We, 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 and he said, no, no, no. They're, they've got to be part of the, of the Union, too. So both of these men, and they were great leaders, both of them, um, had a sense that communication was key to, to keeping us together. What can you tell us about the carriage that's on the screen? <laughs> what made you think of that? <laughs> this carriage is uh, a carriage that uh, lives not far from where we are. If you go down to uh, Washington's house, you see this. And they, they, they have an, uh, an honest um, little plaque that this is very similar to the, wash, the, the great coach Washington took. For many years, that plaque was not there, and it was portrayed as the coach that Washington took. But it turns out that uh, when Washington took his southern tour, the mayor of Philadelphia, a very wealthy man by the name of Paul, um, bought a coach, and Washington really liked it. Wow, you've got a nice coach there. Um, and so he got one. They were imported from England, and they were totally refurbished. Washington's coach had bizarre, and I think totally inappropriate, little um, Renaissance Italian art, little naked things running around his coach. It, I mean, really, it's not like Washington, but there it was. And uh, any case, so he took this tour, and the coach uh, weathered it. I mean, it was really hard, as I say, you know, almost 2,000 miles on impassable roads, but he did it. And then uh, he re retired from the presidency. Coach went back to Mount Vernon, the, the real coach. And then Washington died in 1799, and Martha had trouble keeping the plantation up. And pretty soon, a lot of stuff was auctioned off, including, apparently, the, the great coach. And then it disappeared from history. And like pieces of the true cross and other you know, bones of saints, people wondered, what happened to the great coach? And they looked around. There's one theory, a historian that wrote a history of Philadelphia um, put it mild. I don't know what he was smoking, but he, he, he claimed that the coach had found its way to New Orleans, and it was caught in the middle of the battle between the British and Andrew Jackson, and there were all kinds of bullet holes. And I mean, this coach had been just shot up, and then, then the pigeons lived in it and left pigeon stuff. And it, but then people said, that doesn't seem right. No, no, <laughs> it didn't get there. And then in 1840, a young servant woman that did not have her full faculties claimed that she had seen it in a barn near here and um, that she could testify that that was Washington's real coach. And people went there, and sure enough, there was a coach, and it looked pretty much like what they thought. And it went to the Philadelphia Exposition in 1876, probably the greatest fair in our, our history. And for 25 cents, uh, a, you could sit in Washington's coach. The uh, uh, Queen Victoria's son, who was a you know, scoundrel and playboy, but came to the exhibition. They offered to, uh, him a ride in Washington's coach, but he turned it down because he thought it would be too subversive to the British Empire to ride in a revolutionary coach. So at any rate, so the coach then toured around America. People wanted to see the true coach, but people were a little suspicious, you know. They, they just couldn't prove the provenance. And so finally, the fine ladies that run Mount Vernon hired a great historian, Franklin Jameson, um, and he, he did the study and he found that this coach was the Powell coach, not the Washington coach. But what happened to the Washington coach? Well, it was hiding in plain sight. The bishop, the Episcopalian, the Episcopal bishop, 
Meade of early 19th century Virginia bought that coach at auction and he brought it up to his house. And after a while, he realized it wasn't in such great shape. So he tore it apart. He just destroyed it into little pieces and sold bits of the true coach at flea markets and church rallies <laughs> and whatnot. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of pieces of Washington's coaches circulating in the tide water. Uh, but that is what happened to the true, true coach. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm, I'm curious as to whether members of the Washington Press Corps accompanied the president on this journey. Uh, <laughs> and just generally, how did the press cover this? Uh, the, uh, the press that Washington despised was mostly in the Capitol. And of course, as you know, uh, they did not have uh, you know, reporters in those days. Generally, the editor uh, wrote little stories, oftentimes letters to the editor, and he was writing to himself. But um, some of the New York and Philadelphia papers were, were already filled with um, what we call partisan positions. But the smaller papers in America <laughs> were still small, small time, uh, and um, they, they covered the story um, well, through letters they got. You know, a correspondent tells us that Washington arrived in that kind of thing. And they were generally supportive of, of this. I mean, they, they really, there was a, a, a broad swell of feeling that this was a, a really good idea, a really timely idea. So um, Washington, in his second term, came in for uh, some attacks. Uh, and his second term was, for him, vastly unhappy compared to this early months of his presidency. We had another one right here. Thank you. Aside from the Republican nature of Washington um, and his journeys, how would you distinguish his tours from, say, a royal progress that Elizabeth I might have made where the same thing is happening, interaction with the public, mm -hmm all sorts of wonderful things for her to experience, right. et cetera. Well, that's a, the, you, you show yourself to be a, a historian, at least well-read about progresses. Um, as you, some of you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth especially would love to leave London with a, a, you know, an entourage of 70 people and drop in at the local castle, Duke of York, and say, hi, uh, we're going to be staying for a week, um, and all these folks need to be fed and so on. Uh, and and it, it was not only a political theater to show who was in charge, but also basically uh, maybe uh, calming down some what one of my colleagues called over mighty subjects uh, in, in the hinterland. But Washington brilliantly, he knew this history, and he made two very, very uh, important decisions. That I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, one is he said, look, I'm a president of the American people. I get paid to be president. Now, I'm, I, I'm not a king or a prince. And so the, the cost of my tour will be paid for by the public, not by the people I'm staying with. That's not the goal. Second, he insisted that he would only stay in a public tavern or ordinary. He would not stay in a private home, not, not if he could help it. And people, and this seemed like a very Republican thing to do. It was, but he also sensed, brilliant, he was brilliant politically, that if he stayed at the Bradburn mansion, the next thing, you, you know what's going to happen the next day? Bradburn's going to be bragging. He has a special relation with the president. He'll be forming a little faction and whatnot. So where's that? I'm not going to give these local guys any special leverage. I'm going to stay in public places. So that was very different from the queen. Now, I might tell you, I had great fun. If you read the diary of Washington, which he assumed that no one would read, I guess, at least for a long time, oh, he said these taverns are horrible. <laughs> the food is absolutely rotten. There's bugs everywhere. They mistreat my horses. And so, as I described it as sort of a trip advisor, for uh, a presidential <laughs> journey. Right? 
Could, could, let me uh, let the founding director have a, a question here. I, it's my mansion and all that. Uh, <laughs> talk a little bit about, so the book that you wrote right before this is a book called American Insurgents, or Insurgents, and it's about the popular rebellion in Massachusetts. Talk a little bit about Washington as a founding father and how he came to life for you in a, in a new way as you, mm. or not, as you sort of researched this, uh, this story. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I th I've hinted at, at some of it. It's, uh, it's a question that calls for probably more than glib reflection on my part. But as I said, um, I, as I studied Washington, I, I was, I, I had thought that in the 1780s the problem was just simply um, a fear of anarchy, and there was all this talk about Shays' rebellion. Actually, it was a miserable little thing. It didn't matter much at all. It was, it, but history books make a lot out of it. But in fact, Washington was much more worried about, as I said, protecting the revolution. He would put in so much sacrifice, so much time. He had seen so many people killed uh, that. That, that anything that made it seem like it was slipping away really upset him. That, that, and the second is obvious. I've made the point over and over. I had never realized just what a, a subtle and crafty and original political thinker Washington was. He knew, he knew as Lincoln did, as FDR, maybe Eisenhower, I'd have to think about that, but he, re he really knew how to communicate a vision to a public um, in a way that um, is, is, is really a rare, rare talent. My respect for Washington grew immensely as I wrote this book. There's other founding fathers, Jefferson. The more I studied Jefferson, frankly, the less I liked him. <laughs> but I felt at the end of uh, my Washington book that, hell, if that guy ordered me to march up the hill against British fire, I, I'm, I'm do it right now. I mean, just almost over the centuries in his documents, the power of this man's character came across. Thank you. So there are a few over there, Stephen. We'll come back. Can you speak a little bit more about how many days he spent in any given town or village or city and how effective he was in actually meeting the people. Yeah. Once he got to these towns and he's staying in the public houses, mm -hmm. how did he actually interact with them as opposed to the procession arriving in town? Right. Well, Washington, um, um, being an ex-military man, uh, often saw his um, itinerary, as he called that, uh, his campaign. And um, when he left for the Southern campaign, he told Jefferson and Hamilton, the exact date he would be in every city in the South, it was really a wild bet given, I mean, he had no idea what he paid, but he actually kept up that, that schedule. And my guess is that if the roads were halfway decent, uh, he could make maybe 50 miles a day. Uh, and he generally stayed in little towns just a day. Ex the cities were the exception. Uh, Boston got five days, Charleston a whole week, uh, Port, uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, three days, and, and, so, and so on. And in those cities, um, there were huge parades. I think uh, in Boston, the parade must have uh, lasted three hours to march behind, across. The, I think as many people were in the parade as were in the stands uh, that day. And of course, these parades um, were a form of communication. People carried banners about their their, their trades, for instance, or their, their uh, economic aspirations. Uh, so there was interaction. But each night in a town where he stayed, there would usually be a reception and a nice dinner, and then there'd be endless toasts, which also were a form of communication. People would you know, to toast um, future progress, future canals, whatever they would toast. And then at the last one, uh, Washington, uh, they would toast the president. He was supposed to leave because it would be embarrassing to toast. So he, he would take, but he'd often come in back the door 
uh, around because Washington loved to dance. He absolutely loved dancing. And so often for hours at night, he would dance with the women of the town. He actually kept counts of how many women attended his reception. I thought at first it was sort of like a purient playboy kind of mentality, but he actually really adored women. He liked to be with them. He was more relaxed because men talk was always uh, worrisome. It might carry meaning, but he, so in a sense, and I, uh, it's in the book, the women of America who had no vote, could hold no offices, had greater access to the president of the country than did their husbands who probably really wanted to bend his ear. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, there was a meaningful, uh, ordinary people, beggars, whatnot. And of course, and I should say, African Americans were not part of this world of Washington. Although if you read in the, the book, an incident occurred that I couldn't talk about dealing with a, an African American that challenged Washington that led to his consideration that maybe slavery was a bad deal. And it is not surprising if you read what happened in 1791 to Washington and a man named Hercules. It's not surprising why in 1799, Washington would be the only founding father to free all of his slaves. The seeds were there. Is there a uh, modern driving tour of any of these routes? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I actually asked my press to, uh, I thought you know, it should be, really, I, you know, I'm an entrepreneur myself, I thought well, you, you'd get a little app on your iPhone, you know, <laughs> take, take the tour and you know, you get to some little town like Halifax or Tarboro and you go, Washington was here from Jamaica. Uh, <laughs> my publisher said it cost too, money to, too much money to make an app and it wasn't going to sell anyway. So. Uh, uh, but the best, the best guide by far, and I highly recommend, is Washington's own words. You can buy from uh, the Washington papers, the edited diaries of the, 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 the planter, the general, and the president. And while they're not effusive, you get a feeling for the guy we're talking about. I would also point you to the Mount Vernon webpage in which there's a map, an interactive map you could follow everywhere Washington went. It's kind of a Washington slept here, uh, modernized version, liquid. Uh, uh, I think it's mostly accurate. So no. there, there are there are maps in in this book of of the. I, I I think he probably in the New England tour alone went to and stopped at uh, over sixty towns, which is pretty pretty impressive number. How much of his government did he bring with him, and was there a need to touch base with the capital? Uh, well, as I said, uh, when he went to New England, that tour lasted about three, three weeks, and um, it's an interesting sidelight. Washington um, didn't like Adams. Um, <laughs> Adams was by, Washington tried, oh man did he try, but in the end of the day, this, these two people were not. And so he uh, offered uh, Adams a chance to ride in the coach up through Hartford, Springfield to Boston, back to Adams' home uh, territory, and um, uh, you know, be seen and be part of the show. But, wa but Adams had a little snit I, no one knows what he said. No, no, I'm going to take my own coach. You go and get me. And, stuff. and what we have a great. A Adams may have not been very political himself, but his wife Abigail was. Boy, did she understand how power worked. And she wrote a no nonsense letter to her husband. And she said, You get on that coach. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and so. Um, I think for a brief period uh, north of Boston up to Salem and um, Newburyport, um, uh, Adams may have uh, gone, gone along. Um, but uh, 
your question, you, I'm not answering the whole thing. The second part was, how, did he have to speak uh, in such oh, a way? Oh, yes, right, happen? right. Well, as I say, he, he gave, um, <laughs> again, Adam, to, so he gave uh, Jefferson and uh, Hamilton, who were the, the key uh, members of the guy, he said, look, this is my plan. On this state, I'm going to be in Richmond. In this state, I'm going to be in Halifax, North Carolina. So if something happens, you just you all write to me and tell me what's going on. And he said, um, and it, uh, nobody, no constitutional lawyers, I think, have ever picked up on this. He said, look, if something, if you, look, I'm not here, okay? If you make a decision, and it's not real important, but you know, sort of important, I'll back you up. <laughs> when, when, when I get back, I'll, I'll say that's what I would have done. Because I say, you know, that's, that's kind of strange constitutional law. Uh, <laughs> but he said, if it's really, really, really important, send a courier and I'll try, I'll try to get back. But of course, it would have taken him, oh, several weeks to get back from uh, most of those, those places. One other interesting thing is he said, you know, so you guys, you guys handle it. And then as a, like a little after that, he said, oh, by the way, if the vice president's still around, you can include him in the conversations <laughs> too. <laughs> Great. That's wonderful. Who haven't we heard? Any one last question we haven't heard from somebody here? Right. Oh, let's go. Sorry. Yes, sir, did you come across any foreign press articles of the trip? No, I, not a one. Thank you. I, I, uh, I, um, no, um, there was some. Uh, I, I did some study. Of, there were there was a Br British ambassador and uh, some British agents who were active in that. Thing. I looked in their port, but they seemed to ignore it. And they certainly didn't think he was Clint Oster. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, let's give a big round of applause. Here. So, as you see, the, the mark of a really great historian is to know the difference between something that's famous and something that's important. And, you know, uh, I think Professor Breen got.